Hello, today is uh, Sunday the 8th of April 2012. Uh, this video will be that of the Canadian penny and inflation. The links uh, will be provided in the more information box. There is four of them. So let's get started. This is from CNET and uh, it states, So long Canadian penny, I won't miss you. The uh, It starts off with the uh, image of different pennies and well, and here we can see a 1998 penny. That's zinc, because from the years 97 to 99, they were made out of zinc. And uh, p before that, it was copper. And, well, now it's uh, cheap steel. The first paragraph states, When I was a kid growing up in Montreal, I spent more than a year filling uh, a brown bottle with, us, uh, with, with pennies. When they reached the top and I poured them out, I was crushed that they totaled less than 20 bucks. I'm not a big fan of using different words like bucks, but that, I guess that people like to. Uh, uh, that's besides the point. But what I do realize from the first paragraph is that they are leading to uh, stating that uh, these pennies, they're, they're just useless. In fact, they're lowly. And lowly is defined as having or suited for a low rank or position. And in terms of our currency, it is the lowest rank. Ever since I've had uh, little love for the lowly Canadian set, it's 2.35 grams, mostly steel. And uh, what's interesting about this second paragraph is they talk about metal content, which is interesting how they totally don't talk too, too much about how our older coins used to contain the silver and all the copper and stuff like that. And uh, moving on within uh, this, uh, this article, we uh, can see that... Uh, it's estimating that uh, it costs businesses $150 million a year. Yeah, $150 million, which for a population of over 30 million people, that really isn't that much. But anyway, let's move on to uh, more towards this. They state here that the cost of making a penny is uh, it's a penny and a half right here. It's a penny and a half to mint every penny. Therefore, even though the steel is extremely cheap, you need a several, and I mean lots of uh, current pennies just to get one cent worth of metal value. But it does cost a pay and a half because that's uh, production cost. So whenever you see stuff like uh, copper bullion and they're selling for much more than the spot price, you got to figure that a lot of it's because of uh, work into getting the product as is. It moves on to state that south of the border of the United States that uh, it costs 2.41 cents to mint their pennies. And what's extremely interesting about this is that zinc is pretty much about, uh, about a dollar a pound or, or, or so, somewhere in that area. So they're, they're still putting in the zinc metals where Canada went off of copper in 90, after the 96 season. And for three years went in zinc, where the United States went off of copper in 82 and have stayed within zinc the entire duration. Then they talk about the nickel, which is 11.8 cents, which, like Canada, very similar. Canada went off of uh, their uh, pure nickel in 1982, and from that point on until pretty much 2000, they produced 25% uh, copper, <coughs> excuse me, and... Uh, Excuse me, 25% nickel, 75% copper on the nickels. And that's still the case in the United States, although I have heard that they're going to uh, stop making them in the United States. But when you see that it's costing this much to make it, does that tell you that there's any value in those, at least in comparison with, with fiat uh, digital dollars or fiat uh, paper dollars? Therefore, let's uh, move on to uh, the... Uh, so I'll read this here. At, the, at its plant in Winnipeg, the Royal Canadian Mint still churns out more than a billion pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters, half dollars, and dollars, and two dollar coins annually, even fashions numismatic oddities. I just seen the golds. I wonder what it said. But uh, anyway, let's move on to a few other different uh, uh, things within here. In Canada, the billions of pennies estimated to be in circulation, the government has been churning the coppers coppers out for nearly 150 years. Well, that's, of course, now it's legal tender indefinitely. This is a very interesting, different uh, paragraph, and it's really just a uh, long sentence. And that is to state, well, we're declaring that it's uh, no longer uh, legal tender. This shows you how easy it is for them to declare 
to be so or not to be so. And it's not even copper anymore, but yet they still say. In fact, I, I know a few uh, people who were around back, uh, we'll say back in the 50s and 60s. There's some people that will still bring out their dimes and quarters to this day and say, here's my silver, because they remembered as a child that it, it, was, it was silver. Now today, of course, you remember the pennies, it's the coppers type thing. And uh, there's a couple other different uh, key things that I want to go over before I go on to uh, the inflationary side. And I'm just trying to find it now. It's really just a, a, bit, a comparison just to talk a little bit about a resource-based economy and uh, crime. So let's just type in crime in my search. Okay, they can, we talk about how these, uh, they can also be forged. I want to read up here first. Though I love analogy techno analog technology, uh, per, uh, preferring a book to an uh, e-reader any day, I don't see why we should uh, retain any form of cash. Yes, coins and bills are convenient in that they universally, they're universally accepted. Universally accepted. I'm not even going to go to the whole point that the entire universe accepts it, but we'll say Earth. But why are they universally, or earthly accepted? Why are our current coins and bills, notes, currently accepted? Are we forced to accept it? Did we genuinely decide we want to accept it? So anyway, I find that interesting. They say that uh, the currency doesn't fail in a blackout and are handy for informal transactions like tips and donations. But do they fail during a currency crisis when people wake up to how it's created? I, I'm, I'm wondering about that also. I figured you would write this in the article. I guess not. But they also can be forged, lost, damaged, and destroyed. Well, first of all, can silver and gold be forged? Oh, it can be lost, and it's almost impossible to uh, damage or destroy. And what's this thing about stolen? Like, really? Yeah, I mean, really. If we really cared about theft, crimes, and stuff like that, and that was a real concern that we had, we would really come to the conclusions that this economic model forces a lot of crime that if we didn't want it, we wouldn't have the system in itself. But that's my opinion, and it's not just mine, it's other people's as well, and it's backed up by uh, science and math. But let's now go to uh, talk about the inflationary side, because this is Canada, and uh, what we have here is uh, we'll get this is uh, the, uh, the the Bank of Canada inflation calculator and what we've seen here is that we can uh, figure out how much uh, things would cost in, in different time frames so let's just uh, take a hundred dollars and say uh, well 1914 is the first year we can do so in 1914, what would $100 be in, say, I don't know, 1922? Let's calculate this. That would be a rate of about uh, 55%. That's pretty interesting. Okay. How about if we change it to, say, 1921? 80%. Okay, so we have the deflation in there. The first seven, eight years or so, I pretty much lost uh, twice its value. In fact, it actually did. If I think I moved this to even 1920. Let me just... Okay, maybe 80% it lost from 1914 to 1920. That's, that's inflation. But the Federal Reserve is the United States, though. It's not like we use any of the Federal Reserves as our, our main currency. and Well, I guess maybe 
the Bank of Canada has a very similar kind of uh, way of running the economy, and mainly the monetary system for that matter. But I find that fairly interesting. Let's now go on to, uh, this is uh, UK. The calculator uses a fish UK inflation to show what prices have changed and what money used to be worth. So we can go back in here to 1900. So from, and I want to, okay, in a certain, this is what we want. If, if my first year, we go to 1900 and we'll go into 1913 or even 1914 for that matter. And there was 11% inflation throughout a decade and a half, which I still think is high enough. So if we go from 1914 to 1920 in Europe, we have 123.57%. So apparently, I'm guessing that the start of the Federal Reserve as well affected the United Kingdom, even though they don't use Federal Reserve notes as their regulated currency. No, but that's how I think Great Britain pounds would have been what it would be. Finally, we have New Zealand. Now it comes up. You have two thousand. This is what we'll look the screen will look like if you. Uh, go to this page from the start. So we've had 37.4% inflation, what they're stating anyway, from 2000 to 2011. Now what I like about New Zealand is we can go back all the way to 1862, and they have it by quarters as well. So we'll go to uh, when the Federal Reserve was created, 1913, which was quarter four as well. So let's find 13Q4, which is right uh, in here. Push the calculate button. And uh, it's updating the form elements, it says on the lower part, so it, uh, there we go. So therefore, a basket of goods and services that cost, uh, I guess that means a pound, uh, I'm not too sure, but anyway, one unit would be 0.73, which means there was deflation of about 27% over pretty much a half a decade. Okay. So now let's go to 1914 Q1. And we'll do 1920 again because that seems to be when it topped for the short term anyway, because obviously it hasn't topped anywhere near yet as far as inflation is concerned. Let's calculate it again. It's updating the form elements. It takes a little while to do it, but it'll come up very soon. And 72.2% uh, inflation in six years. And as far as inflation since 1920, well, I did this, this is with the Canadian, I did this spreadsheet up with Canadian numbers. These are the years and how much the inflation rate uh, was for Canada percentage uh, moves. So therefore, the, uh, there was a few years where there was absolutely no inflation, and then again, two straight years where there was no inflation again. So there's the chart. It goes from doubling its value, and then pretty much retraces 61.8% on the way down. And of course, if you look at how much things cost back in the 1900s, 1920s, even the 1950s and 70s and 90s, you can see that there's been a lot of inflation. And as far as the annual inflationary period, notice, like I say, many years it didn't inflate at all. Unless there was price controls, which quite frankly in a free market, which you claimed it was, it, it should not happen. It should at least go up or down a little bit, or the odd time, it should be exact par. Because if it's down at, say, here, which is 87, that means the inflation that year meant that the dollar could buy you 87% uh, of what it, uh, or you could buy with 87% of the currency could buy you what it used to. So you could, in fact, save uh, a little bit or by like 12% more when there's deflation, because this was the deflationary period. 
but to have the prices at the, the levels tells me are they accurate levels. It's pretty sane to state that there's definitely been a lot of inflation and whether the numbers are accurate or not, it's been quite high. But before the Federal Reserve came in in 1913, the inflation we had, at least through research via the internet, has been very small. And now we have this today. And the reason why this uh, penny is no longer being part of the system is purely because of inflation. So when you come out and state that it's lowly, at uh, a very low rank of position. It used to have, you could get something out of it. And of course that has been taken away. I, when you lose 92, 96, 98, 99%, that's a major loss in value for the currency. Thank you for tuning in and have yourself a great day. Bye-bye.